yes that's a very important point about the behavior of the ruvasamuni and at one level it seems so unreasonable you come as a guest to somebody's house and what you're doing is you're cursing your host so <laughs> and that too for a minor infraction without even understanding the situation so why would a character like durvasa muni behave like that and we see that same durvasa muni now there are different vyasa devs that are described because vyasa is a generic name for an editor But durvasa muni suppose the same person the durvasa muni is also supposed to have blessed radharani and he came to serve uh, he came to vrindavan barsana radharani served him and then durvasa muni blessed radharani uh and that whatever she cooks will taste like nectar and whoever eats her food will never fall sick and when you know i heard about that she wanted that uh she wanted that radharani should cook for krishna so how is it that that same character is now he cursed parish uh, cursed ambarish so to understand this it's a uh, it's generally the way we approach scripture especially characters in scripture who are who are otherwise exalted who are worshipable who are respectable then when we analyzing their actions we focus not so much on who is right as what is right so say if you consider sacred scriptural characters the focus is on what is right shila prabhupad for example in the bhagavad gita's first chapter uh, talks about how arjuna is actually very thoughtful very contemplative he is thinking and he is asking what is to be done so he is deliberating before acting he is not just rushing into a war and that indicates that actually he is qualified for getting spiritual knowledge but then in the next chapter right to the first verse itself prabhupada starts saying that arjuna he is in tears and tears are a side of ignorance ignorance and attachment so what is going on in chapter 1 is uh, he is praised and then he is almost being criticized so the point is that in different contexts shri prabhupada is almost like giving us the maximum mileage from scripture the point is in the first chapter arjuna demonstrates one quality of a disciple that eagerness to understand eagerness to learn and not to rush into situations but to deliberate situations but in the next chapter prabhupada wants to convey another character of a disciple the disciple should not think that i know better than the guru that you may be ready for enlightenment that is good but you are not enlightened right now and that we need to acknowledge so uh, so is arjuna good or bad ultimately we can say that arjuna is or propa also say that his illusion was orchestrated by the lord so that the gita could be spoken so that's why we don't want to judge and condemn sacred characters so we don't want to say durvasa muni was in rajoguna or tamoguna but we can say that in this particular situation his actions were certainly ob- questionable or objectionable and even you could say outrageous at one level and that is a part of the plan of the lord so i would like to place this in the broader context of the shrimad bhagavatam the, the bhagavatam ultimately it, all its 12 cantos are meant for one purpose that is to help parikshit maharaj focus his mind on krishna hmm? so this verse sabai mana krishna pada aravind ayur that can also be seen in that light so generally when something bad happens to us our mind tends to uh, tends to become upset angry resentful why did this happen to me and the bhagavatam purpose now how does parishit maharaj help this pursue how does shubhadev goswami pursue this purpose one is by storing stories of krishna and his devotees 
that way it will help him to focus on krishna hmm? but simultaneously parikshit maharaj could have been told many many different stories but the bhagavatam tells him stories that are remarkably similar to his hmm? that stories so where characters also could have been resentful so the story is chosen to tell him a story is similar to his similar to his means that for some small mistake a person suffers terribly so we can see that this theme is there in right from you can see dhruva it was not even a mistake he just wanted to sit on his mother's lap and he he was not driven out of the forest driven out to the forest by a curse but he just couldn't bear it he had to leave he went to the forest then we have the story of chitraketu where he just laughed not out of criticism not out of sarcasm but out of amazement and he was cursed to become a demon and then after that we also have various stories like that now in these two stories we consider the story of ambarish thereafter which comes so this was fourth canto we can analyze multiple stories like this but let's focus on a few now in these two stories the key point is the 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 bad the bad guy is actually not the bad guy yeah that the cursor or cursor or the punisher or the person who causes the troubler trouble maker is actually not a villain no dhruva's mother is not e- step mother is not evil hmm uh, chitraketu when is cursed actually is cursed by parvati who is an exalted character so if we consider parikshit maharaj also he was cursed by a brahmana he was a brahmana boy but there's no description that shrungi was like a villain who was out to destroy people in demoniac ways nothing like that he just was overpowered by his power he became corrupted and similarly here is the story of durvasi so if we consider the comparison between parikshit situation and durvasi situation in one sense when we feel that we all will suffer in life you no know? suffering is something which is there for everyone now that is difficult to bear now suffering is even more difficult to bear when it feels more difficult if it is unfair if it feels unfair that means i didn't do anything and still i am suffering and you could say it is most difficult to bear when we feel singled out nobody else is suffering i alone am suffering so if say that there's a if there's a pandemic and everybody is getting sick then we don't feel so bad but if there's a pandemic and nobody falls sick except we alone falls sick. <laughs> what did i do <laughs> especially if i had been maintaining my health well and somebody else eats anything does anything that person is not falling sick i fall sick <laughs> that feels that feels worse <laughs> so <laughs> so we could say that Uh, when we feel that the suffering is unfair or unfair in terms of our actions or unfair in terms of we, it has come to us alone it's very difficult to bear mm-hmm. and both ambarish maharaj and parikshit maharaj suffer, uh, they both suffer similar similar sufferings you know that they the difficulty that has come upon them both of them are cursed mm-hmm. now the curse for let's we'll call let's compare we will just do a broad comparison and then the point i'm making over here and is going over a long answer to your question about durvasa muni but my point is that hmm, here the example that is being given is that the focus is not so much on durvasa muni's actions as on Parik- as ambarish maharaj's response to it so we could say at the parikshit maharaj he got 7 days hmm? Ambarish Maharaj was almost like instant death. The demon came to try to kill him immediately, mm-hmm. and we could say Parikshit Maharaj. At least there was a mistake. 
a small mistake at least hmm? that he had put a garland around it was certainly the punishment was far greater but both was unfair but we could say here there was no mistake at all hmm? no mistake at all that he had actually consulted the brahmanas he had used his intelligence and the action he had done was for actually the good of the society after he was just breaking his fast and then on top of that parikshit maharaj he didn't have he didn't have to he didn't have to no interaction with shringi if somebody has hurt us we just don't want to be we don't want to see them we don't want to talk with them okay you hurt me just get out of my life i don't want to be near you but ambarish so we could say um, no ambarish maharaj parikshit maharaj forgave shringi he didn't uh, try to counter curse or counter attack he did not use his royal power he forgave but there was no interaction hmm? and in one sense it's easy out of mind out of sight is out of mind but ambarish maharaj situation is worse where he not only had to forgive but he also had to seek forgiveness for him from sudarshan that means he has not done anything wrong please forgive him now that is far worse hmm? that means say if somebody has committed a crime against us somebody has robbed us and we forgive them but the police want to charge them and we go to the police and tell them no oh, please is out of such a bad person you forgive him that is far more difficult that somebody can go to that extent it's one thing to pray that uh, this unfair situation please give me the strength to tolerate but it's an, another thing that a person who has done something wrong to us to seek for seek forgiveness for them can you say one can you say one thing also about how it was that umbrish felt that he w- he was the offender yes that is true in one sense we can say parikshit maharaj also took responsibility for his mistake but with respect to umbrish maharaj while there was no mistake still he felt that no, i could have done better so he was taking took responsibility hmm? that for the situation he felt that it was because of me this great sage was put into the trouble wow and therefore he sought forgiveness now here we can think of a parallel with how jesus christ also said forgive them for they know not what they do so there he is also seeking forgiveness on the behalf of those who are crucifying him and that is far more difficult generally when we talk about tolerance mm, now there are two distinct things one is adversity is difficult to tolerate but far more difficult to tolerate is atrocity so in the in the shrimad bhagavatam this is referred to as aho kashtam kashta is atrocity but this is anyayam anyay sorry kashta is adversity adversity is a bad thing happens to us when we are going about a normal life and suddenly a storm comes or a flood comes and uh, upsets our life But atrocity is where there's a human agent who is who is responsible for our problems. That say a flood comes to our house and we get in trouble. But we have a political enemy, and that enemy controls the nearby dam, and that person deliberately opens the dam so that our house gets flooded and our property gets destroyed. Then to exhibit tolerance is far more difficult. So here tolerance is tough. but amid adversity it is the toughest it is far tougher you can see and to tolerate is tougher but here to ask for forgiveness that is the toughest ask to not just to ask that person that be for that ask that person be forgiven so through this basically ambrish maharaj is being used as an example oh parijit maharaj don't give in to resentment don't give in to anger just focus on the lord and this is how great souls have acted in the past and now for this purpose 
See, when I mean, atrocity comes upon us, when somebody, some terrible thing happens to us, now well, that is also, if we consider, which is more difficult to bear. Bad people doing bad things. It is, it is difficult to bear. How can somebody be so evil? That's difficult to bear. But good people doing bad things is even more difficult to bear. Because in this case, in this case, we just have low expectations. Yeah, they are like that. What else can you expect from them? But in the case of good people, we have high expectations. And you should be behaving in a good way. That's why I say, if, if we are doing a business dealing with someone, and in the business dealing, somebody cheats us. And we feel, we feel outraged. But okay, people are like that. The world is like that. But suppose we are doing some service with some devotee. And then we do the service together and, then the, and at the end of the service, the devotee steals credit from us. You know, the devotee says, I did everything. And then it's far more difficult to be here. Because not only what, what is stolen from us, but it is, it shakes our, it, it, it shatters our expectations. So when a good person does a bad thing, at that time to forgive is very, very much more difficult. And that is why Sometimes conflicts between good people are sometimes more painful than conflicts between bad people, two bad people. And there are conflicts, yeah, you know, if you do, if you, if you mess with me, I'll destroy you. And just the expectation. So what do we do in such a situation? And a good person does bad things. Conflicts between bad people, more or less, you know, in one sense, the terms are clear. No, whoever has more power, they will win. But the pain is much more for conflicts among good people. And that's why Prabhupada often said that you know you love for the when you show by how you cooperate. So going back to the, your specific question, my understanding is that Durvasa Muni is in one sense orchestrated by the Lord to demonstrate the glory of Ambarish Maharaj. It's like in the seventh canto, specifically, it is stated that when Narsimhade, when Hiranyakashipu was terrorizing everyone, even Narad Muni bowed down to Hiranyakashipu. Only person who did not bow down was Prahalad. That when Narsimhade eventually appeared, it is Prahalad's singular glorification. Nobody was able to pacify him, neither Brahmaji. It's even Lakshmi Devi was not able to pass it. <coughs> but Prahlad was glorified. So all other characters, they consciously or unconsciously, they contribute to the glorification of the central character. So is Lakshmi Devi not a good devotee? She's the greatest devotee. She's the consort of the Lord. But in this particular pastime, it is Prahlad's glory that is to be highlighted. And therefore, all other characters contribute to that. Now, of course, Durvasa Muni is not said to be a great devotee like Prahalad, sorry, like Lakshmi Devi. But the point is, as I said, what is right and what is wrong, if you want to oh, not if we focus on what is right, then more than who is right, then this particular story is to illustrate the focus is more on or more on Ambarish uh, Maharaj's greatness, uh, not on Durvasa Muni's uh, short temper. So that's why the story does not condemn, end with Durvasa Muni being condemned. Now, I'll just make one more point about Durvasa actions. The Bhagavatam has one theme. So here, if we, if we consider from one perspective, there's a key difference between words. Let's confirm. So, if you consider Durvasa versus Ambarish, so in one sense, Durvasa represents the yoga path and Ambarish represents the bhakti path. So, this means more the path of austerity, the path of renunciation. Durvasa Muni is a Muni, and the Bhagavata is demonstrating the glory of bhakti as compared to other paths. So, Durvasa Muni is. He, it's not so much his character, 
as his path being compared so we can comp- see this as a comparison of the path of renunciation versus the path of devotion and and here what is demonstrated is the path of devotion is far greater this is actually far lesser so some ways the bhagavatam is almost being subversive subversive means that it is the bhagavatam is inverting normal hierarchies two hierarchies are inverted over here invert the standard pious hierarchy standard hierarchies of piety that abhirish maharaj is a grahastha so as a grahastha is lower than a sanyasi and ambarish maharaj is kshatriya the kshatriya is lower than a brahmana but it is being shown that here grahastha is shown to be greater than a sanyasi and similarly a kshatriya is shown to be greater than a brahmana and the point of this is that actually it is not that all grahastha the greater sanyasi all kshatriya greater than brahmanas the point is a bhakta is greater than a yogi at the point of this past time is to glorify bhakti so despite having performed so many austerities uh, durvasa muni is succumbs to anger the bhagavatam gives a beautiful metaphor it says lust is like a vast ocean and it is very difficult to cross most people when they are crossing they just sink into the ocean of lust they they succumb to their senses but he said there are some sages who cross beyond this ocean of lust but if they don't take shelter of krishna's lotus feet then there is this puddle of anger and they fall and sink in the puddle of anger <laughs> <laughs> so the point is not just to conquer lust or to conquer anger the point is that we need to take shelter of krishna without if we are not taking shelter of krishna if our focus is not upward towards krishna then this or that or something some or the other anartha will catch us so here durva it is given said durva samani He is he is a renunciate, and there is no past time where described. It is described that there are any problems with his renunciation, that he gets attracted to some woman or something like that. It is not described anywhere as far as I have read in the Puranas. But yet he is known to be short tempered. He is infamous as being short tempered. So he keeps falling into this puddle of lust, of anger, although he is crossed over the ocean of as a ocean of uh, lust. So Ambarish Maharaj. is able to avoid anger by having taken shelter of krishna so that focus on bhakti that taking shelter of krishna is what is emphasized this is emphasized for parishit maharaj that don't get angry don't feel angry with life don't feel angry with shringi just focus on krishna and that can apply for all of us also yes prabhu wow. that's a wonderful can you save this can you save this 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 is the whole outline for a, a wonderful talk in the future is yes, there any way that you can get a screenshot of that whole that whole yes, presentation I'll, and send I'll it send to it. me yes sure i'll send it to you thank you i can't believe that you just did that right off the top of your head <laughs> thank you happy to be of service it's your association that is inspiring me to speak something <laughs> you know again referring to um the presentation you gave last night where you very scientifically explained the different ways that people in different modes of material nature react some contemplate and then act and some act and then contemplate and some act and don't and so what what would you say about ambrish he does have a history of flying off the handle um he's not he's not he's not reputed to be the most compassionate the most uh, empathetic person and so what he did was not totally unexpected yes so so, so what what percentage would you say of this is uh uh because most most people who, who like parikit he garlanded the sage sage he appeared to have been affected by hunger and thirst um that was uncharacteristic of him similarly mm-hmm. uh, parvati who is a great ascetic herself that was somewhat uncharacteristic of her to curse chitraketu for what he did but in darvas's case it it it's much more expected it's le- it's less surprising So how much of what he was doing was influenced by the Lord and therefore uncharacteristic of him and how much was 
characteristic actually dictated by the modes of passion and ignorance. Yes, a good point. So as I said, I have not had any reference that, that it is said that Durva Samuni was orchestrated by the Lord. I was only making the point that I would hesitate to say that Durva Samuni represents the lower modes because still he is a great sage. That is the point I was making. But definitely it is true that it is, it is his characteristic to get angry, as you said, to fly off the handle. And uh, he, it, so it also indicates that somebody could be a sage and still have some conditioning. And uh, that conditioning, so it's interesting that the Bhagavatam's mood overall, it one sense, it repeatedly emphasizes that devotees are greater than Brahmanas. And yet, the Bhagavatam does not uh, satirize or carry or trivialize or demonize Brahmana. You know, they're, they're just laughing stocks. Hmm? They, are in, they are worthless. The Bhagavatam, in one sense, maintains a respectful tone towards the Brahmanas. So, Durvasamuni is to be respected. But the point is that Bhakti is to be respected even more. So, yes, it's his characteristic behavior. So, sometimes uh, this is we could make another point here that the devotion can be manifested through two ways. Generally, we think of serious devotee as somebody who has purity. And generally, purity means we generally put it as that person has conquered lust. Mm -hmm. Hmm? That person has conquered sensual desire. But, you know, devotion can also be manifested as humility. Hmm? And in some ways, the devotion manifested as humility is actually better than devotion manifested as, this is greater than science too greater than science, that devotion manifested humility is better than as purity. Because what happens when there is a focus on, when there is a person is obsession with purity, then when there is obsession with purity, mm -hmm. there, are two, there are two dangers that can happen because of that. One is that, so actually this is better, this is questionable. When there is obsession with purity, there can be constantly a sense of superiority or insecurity, a sense of ego or a sense of, mm -hmm. I am so great, just see how pure I am. And otherwise, oh, I am worthless, I am useless. Sometimes in bhakti also, we try to rate our devotion solely by our capacity to give up sense gratification. And yes, we all have conditionings. We want to give them up. But there is this unnecessary agitation of the mind. Oh, I am so great. And, or I am so fallen. And sometimes when we say, I am a fallen soul, we focus so much on the fallen part that we forget the soul part. That mm -hmm. I am a soul, that I am a part of Krishna, that I am still precious, that I am still beloved by Krishna. So that, that superiority and insecurity can come up. And this insecurity can lead to discouragement, a person may even quit the practice of bhakti. But then that superiority can lead to a actually disrespect. It can lead to offenses. That means anybody who is not up to my standard, that person doesn't have even the right to speak in my presence. That person doesn't even have a right to exist if I don't allow that person to exist. So we often get a sense of entitlement because of our purity. And then we condemn others. And this is what happened with Durvasamuni. He thought, because I'm a renunciate, I'm entitled to respect. And that respect is not being given. That is outrageous. Who is this person acting like this? So, in many ways, it's on the spiritual path. While cultivating purity is important, cultivating humility is even more important. In the Shikshashtakam, we consider first the emphasis is on is on humility. We have we have third verse is Trunadapi. And in the fourth verse is Radhanam Najanam Sundari. The idea is if first there is humility and then purity follows, then that purity will actually lead to Nadanam Najanam Sundari that it will lead to be focusing on Krishna. 
when we have humility we become absorbed in the glory of krishna and then we automatically can say no to temptations and that takes us even closer to krishna otherwise if purity comes without humility then essentially what happens to put it this way that instead of looking up to krishna we start looking down at people <laughs> <laughs> so bhakti is meant to look up not look down <laughs> so if this happens if a focus on purity more than humility that's what happens so we could say this is what has happened to durvasa muni his his renunciation creates a entitlement mentality which leads to the short temper leads to anger okay wonderful answer i uh, you're um let me see if i can get facebook here um okay yeah we've got facebook i'm seeing if there are any questions Nope, just just uh, pranams and all glories to Prabhupada, and please accept my humble obeisances. So I don't I don't have uh, apparently your your presentation is uh, so complete that our Facebook joinees only have awe and appreciation for it. But um, I'm hoping that you can send me. Is it possible to send just a, a copy of all of this? Yes, definitely, bro. I'll send it to you today itself. Mm. I, I I can't believe that just out of out of almost ex tempore you you produced this completely airtight logical sequential presentation about the glories of Maharaj Ambrish and the superiority of bhakti yoga as compared to asceticism and yoga. Mm. Thank you, Guru. I said it's your association that inspired me to speak something. I'm grateful to be of service. Thank you so much for the opportunity, bro. You have any realizations you would like to share? I have been speaking, you know. I should be hearing from you also. <laughs> that was such a complete presentation. Almost leaves, it almost leaves nothing, nothing unsaid or no area covered. It's interesting, though, that when uh, Sudarshana Sudarshana Chakra comes, that it lights up everything like the sun. It, it prior to the advent of the Sudarsana Chakra, which incidentally uh, resided within the palace of, of uh, Ambarish. Ambarish was so dear to Lord Krishna that it's described that Lord Krishna gave the Sudarsana Chakra the order to stay in the palace of Ambarish. And so when Dharvasa threw the fire weapon at Ambarish, the Sudarsana did not have to come from a long distance away. Sudarsana Chakra was already in house. And, and, and when the Sudarsana the, the Chakra appeared like the morning sun, banishing the fog. So all the, all the achievements, all the self-made power of Dervasa uh, diminished into insignificance in the light of the Sudarsana Chakra. So all those points that you make about the superiority of bhakti and the higher level of self-control exhibited by the devotee are made abundantly clear in the presence of the light, uh, the knowledge, the purity, the humility of the Sudarsana Chakra. The whole situation becomes completely clarified as soon as the Sudarsana, the, the greatness of Maharaj Ambarish and the, the shortcomings of the yogis and the ascetics. And it's interesting to note, do you want to just make one more comment? I've taken enough of your valuable time, but could you just make one more comment about the happy ending? The fact is that Durbasa Muni and Ambrish became great friends after this. Yeah, that's that's extraordinary. The, the, the Bhagavatam here, at least in this particular pastime, it illustrates how the remarkable power of tolerance not only in preventing a bad situation from becoming worse, but actually making a bad situation better. So it is, Ambarish Mahaj already had a respectful discussion about Durvasa, but Durvasa Muni gets a far greater appreciation. So you know, friendship has to be both ways. We can be friend towards someone. Love can be one way, but a loving relationship has to be two ways. So through this pastime, Durvasa Muni gets a, far greater appreciation of devotees, especially of Ambarish Maharaj and thus he becomes, uh, they, they end up, they be end up uh, end on very good terms. And uh, yeah, so sometimes conflicts 
there to be results by thy patience by tolerance that's what illustrated a devotee so gracefully in the in the gita it is described one of the characters of devotees that is i think one of my my favorite characteristic is that yasman no dujate loko lokan no dujate chaya one who does not disturb others and one who is not disturbed by others mm-hmm. and i see that devotees who emphasize purity are exactly the opposite they constantly disturb others don't do this don't do this you are like this you are like that <laughs> and, and they are not just making uh, they are not just making others life miserable actually seeing other devotees not up to their standard makes them also feel miserable <laughs> so ultimately amrish maharaj shows this that he is not disturbed by what 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 uh, what uh, durvasa has done and he does not disturb durvasa and that is what wins the heart of durvasa also 